we're looking at Pilger's work to see what kind of example we might find for this kind of, this kind of engaged journalism. So the first, there are a couple of clips I want to play from a film of Pilger's that came out around 2000 called The New Rulers of the World. The New Rulers of the World was the title of a book and a companion film that Pilger made looking at the global economy. In the 1990s, everybody was talking about globalization, how advances in communication and transportation technologies had made the world more interconnected than ever, more globalized, and how the world economy was becoming more integrated. Right? There was a lot of talk in the 1990s about how national boundaries didn't matter anymore, that the world was now one big economy. But of course, in economies, there are winners and there are losers, and this film was an exploration of who wins and who loses in this big new global economy. He did it by focusing on one particular country, the country of Indonesia, a country that had been ruled by a military dictator since 1965, when a coup in Indonesia overturned the democratically elective government, installed one of the generals as the so-called president, a man named Suharto, and in the process resulted in the murder of somewhere between a half a million and a million people. It was a real slaughter in Indonesia. And as is so often the case, that slaughter, that coup, that military intervention to overthrow a democratically elected government was strongly supported by the United States and Great Britain. That the United States, looking for what it called stability in Southeast Asia, backed the general who engaged in this coup. And then, late in the 90s, around 1998, finally the population of Indonesia overthrew that General Suharto. And this film is looking at that history and asking critical questions about it. So, the first clip I want to play involves Pilger interviewing an official, in this case an official from the British Chamber of Commerce in Jakarta, in Indonesia. So we talked a lot about official sources, how mainstream journalism is sometimes captured by official sources. Pilger also sometimes interviews official sources. But the difference that I think you'll see is that instead of adopting the framework of official sources and using it in his reporting, he tends to do a lot of reporting and then come in and interview official sources and ask them rather critical questions, such as in this one. Was the foreign business community here aware that they were dealing not just with a corrupt, nepotistic dictatorship, but also with a mass murderer? That's a, that's a, that's a very general question. Um, well, no, um, it's quite specific, actually. I mean, mass murder is mass murder. Um, The, 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 that the fact that many people have died in Indonesia in, 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 in uh, unfortunate, tragic circumstances um, at the uh, directly or indirectly as a result of the previous regime um, is hugely unfortunate. Um, whether if foreign investment had not been here, that would have prevented in any way, um, those events um, occurring. Nobody, nobody has perfect vision on, on what might have been. There is Pilger bringing to bear the results of all this reporting in very critical questioning of an official, asking a simple question. The West, especially the US and Great Britain, supported General Suharto in this incredibly violent campaign to overthrow a democratically elected government. Why would the, the U.S. and Great Britain do that? Are the leaders of the U.S. and Great Britain bloodthirsty maniacs? Do they enjoy killing for the sake of killing? Do U.S. presidents and British prime ministers wake up in the morning and say, I hope somebody gets murdered today? Do they, 
Let get, can I get a report on some mass slaughter somewhere? Is that what they do? I don't think so. So why would governments support a military coup that begins ruthlessly, continues ruthlessly as thousands of tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of bodies start to pile up in ways that no one can ignore. It's not, this was not done in secret. The US and Great Britain were celebrating this particular military coup. Why would they do that? Well, Pilger is suggesting maybe because the goal of the West, the US and Great Britain in this case, is to create a stable climate, quote unquote, for business investment so that Western corporations can exploit the markets, the labor, the resources of places like Indonesia. In other words, he's connecting the political and the economic. He's saying that the political policies pursued by the leaders had an economic base, and he's questioning someone from that economic realm, asking a very impolite question, questions you don't tend to see asked on Meet the Press or Face the Nation or CNN's television talk shows. The questions that Pilger is asking are almost never asked in the mainstream media because they would be considered biased, maybe just even impolite. But Pilger doesn't shy away from such questions. Truth is, I think he likes it. <laughs> I think he likes pressing these officials. And they don't always enjoy it. Let me give you one more. This is from later in the same film. In this case, he's moving forward in time to ask about the role in the film of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. The World Bank and the IMF are the two global financial institutions that probably have the most to do with why the world looks the way it does economically today. They provide loans, often loans to developing countries, but loans that come with requirements, requirements on how that economy must be structured. And there's been a lot of critique, <coughs> excuse me, of the way the IMF and the World Bank have made those loans, the way they have engaged with some of those governments. What do you say to those 17 million people who call for a complete, and I repeat, complete cancellation of debt as the only way to lift the huge number of poor people in the world out of poverty? I'd say uh, two things. Uh, First, what will lift people out of poverty is not cancelling their debt, but what, their, what policies their countries pursue, whether they educate poor people, whether they give them health. And so the question, and then what sort of economies they try to run. Do they integrate them into the world economy, or do they run corrupt economies? Those are the primary determinants of how well countries will do. That is the answer to, to uh, how, what determines how, whether people get out of poverty. It can be done. It has been done. Should we cancel the debt? Canceling debt is one way of giving resources to poor countries. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to see is a much greater flow of resources to poor countries. I'd like to see the markets of the industrialized countries opened so that these countries where people are poor and can produce agriculture are able to export. That's what will get them out of poverty. The statement, debt relief is the only thing that will get them out of poverty, is wrong. It would help, uh, provided it is accompanied by a whole set of other measures. But surely debt, even in one's own life, and especially a poor person's life, is the greatest cause of real poverty. No. And, and when you have a country devoting half its budget to paying off a debt, when you have the poorest countries in the world sending out millions of dollars into the rich world, um, surely um, as a priority that debt has to uh, that debt has to be either relieved substantially or go altogether. Doesn't that make it just seems common sense to me? If I if I got that wrong? Yeah, you've got it wrong. Oh, let me explain. Okay. Uh, first of all, you are indebted, and I am indebted. And I would not be better off if I asked somebody to come and cancel my debt because I'd never be able to borrow again. And debt is a normal way of borrowing in order to do things, purchase goods, invest, uh, when you don't have the resources. And they'll generate an income and you'll repay. 
So the notion that all debt should be cancelled is a bad one. Financial systems operate on the basis of debt that is uh, paid. The Human Rights Commission of the United Nations, in a very comprehensive report, said, and I quote, the institutions of globalization have yet to seriously address the issue of human rights in a democratic fashion. Globalization has caused global conditions of inequality and discrimination. Well, what's your response to that? I, I simply can't respond because I have no idea where, what, uh, what evidence they're referring to. Human globalization has caused discrimination? I'd yes. have thought it was the opposite. I'd have thought that... Uh, no, they, for instance, they singled out workers in third world economic processing zones. Again, part of a, a prescription, may not be IMF prescription, but certainly part of the, a global prescription, uh, in which um, it said um, these workers were prey for exploitation and because unemployment, for instance, they mentioned Indonesia, had been forced down by the so-called economic crisis of the late 90s, their human rights were lost. Now, Indonesia grew as a result of integrating into the global economy from the 60s on and uh, incomes in Indonesia rose. It was a dictatorship. Some of their rights were, uh, were uh, suppressed and it was a very bad dictatorship. Uh, excuse but they, me, Mr. Fisher, may, as you say, some of their rights were oppressed. A third of the population of East Timor died or were killed under the Suharto regime. What are you asking me that question for? Do you think we supported the Suharto regime? Well, Don't be ridiculous. Well, did you speak out against it? Did, 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 your, did your institution, the IMF, uh, speak out? The World Bank didn't. The first time after 30 odd years in there, the first time they spoke out was 1998. What did the IMF say about it? When the IMF went into Indonesia, it insisted on a removal of a host of corrupt practices that began to weaken that regime. It was not an intended consequence, but it was intended that we went in and helped remove the corrupt practices in a variety of monopoly areas. So Pilger is asking the IMF official to explain his view of globalization, but then challenging this notion that somehow the IMF is without guilt in this. Pressing to say, well, certainly you knew what was going on in the Saharto reason. And you know that Pilger is onto something because the guy gets a little testy, yes? The guy doesn't like being questioned like that. And part of the reason is that official, and officials in general, typically are not questioned like that when they're being interviewed by mainstream journalists who adhere to that objective code. So Pilger, in taking a different stance, is not ignoring the people who run these powerful institutions. He's not trying to deny them a voice. He's offering them a chance to speak with the understanding that they will be critiqued. And this is another one of those things to reflect on, what do you learn most from? The mainstream practices around objective journalism or Pilger's approach, which has rejected those objective practices. Give that some thought between now and next week.